Happy Thanksgiving. I know that that is probably extremely difficult for some of you to say, uh, because I know that many of you have been stuck in your home, haven't been able to get out because you're dealing with uh, uh, the coronavirus, and you haven't been able to spend time with your family, you haven't been able to spend in fellowship with uh, friends and with family around a dining room table filled with all kinds of food from turkey and ham to dressing to stuffing to green corn to yams to deviled eggs to green bean casseroles to you know pecan pie and to, um, chest pie. There's so many things that Thanksgiving when it deals with the meal that we absolutely love. But I know that some of you have not been able to really partake in all of that. I know it's hard right now to really take a step back and say, hey, what am I thankful for? But you know, our lesson today is going to kind of uh, look at that. What can we be thankful for by looking at First Corinthians chapter 15? But before we get into the lesson, I, I do want to uh, go over a list of names and say a prayer on behalf of these people. Uh, this is a long list of all those that are dealing with uh, uh, COVID or a loss of someone very close to them or some that are just in the hospital. So uh, just uh, give me this opportunity to share with you some of these names. Misty Adams has COVID. Riley Adams has COVID. Uh, Jeffrey Chisholm uh, is going to have, well, is, is in North Mississippi Medical Center. Allison Cooper has COVID. Kenzie Cooper is recovering from COVID. Uh, Merlin Gill is in room uh, 157 at the North Mississippi Medical Center here in Amory. Uh, Kylie Edwards is recovering from COVID. Sherry Fears uh, has COVID and double pneumonia. She's at North Mississippi Medical Center in Amory. Dan Franklin uh, is a co-worker of, of Vaughn Howe, um, also has COVID. And Fusel, this is KC Morris's grandmother, uh, is also declining in, in health. Vera Gray, we need to continue to remember. Uh, Dewey Hannon family that passed away um, uh, Wednesday morning. His funeral uh, was uh, yesterday. Lynn Howell, Matthew's dad, we need to uh, remember. Hannah Grace James is Ashton Cooper's girlfriend. Uh, she has COVID. Corey Kent has COVID along with double pneumonia. Um, Lisa Howell's aunt, uh, Miss Knight, has COVID and also double uh, pneumonia. She's at the North, North Mississippi Medical Center in Tupelo. Uh, Tammy Minor has COVID. Um, Mary, Lou, uh, Mary Lois Moore has a blood clot in her spleen. Jacob Munn, uh, this is Jeanette Kent's niece's son, is in ninth grade. Student at Hatley has a rare tumor uh, in his sinus cavity. will have surgery at UAB over Christmas break, so we need to remember him. Uh, Alan Pearson has COVID. Benita Pearson failed last Monday morning, has four staples in the back of uh, her head. And then on top of that, she has COVID also. Brian Pearson has COVID. Uh, Roy Pound's family, uh, uh, we need to remember uh, that family uh, who passed away Tuesday. Uh, Bella and Mesa and Mia Stallings are recovering from COVID uh, and strep. And, and the list just seems to continue to go on that we need to remember in our prayers. And so at this time, let's just go to our uh, Heavenly Father and pray on behalf of all these people and just the things that are coming up for the next uh, few weeks. So let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your most precious and holy name. Father, we do come before you at this time just asking you to give uh, all the, the names that I have given the strength to, to heal them, to give them comfort and peace. Father, there are many that are dealing with uh, uh, COVID-19 right now. Just ask them to, to recover quickly. Father, that there not be anything serious that comes about with this. And Father, we just ask your prayer for all those who have lost loved ones. Give them strength during this time. Help them to find the peace and the understanding that comes when you lose somebody so close. And Father, we just ask that you um, be with this country. Father, as we start a new transition uh, in, in, in our government, and Father, uh, let these men uh, lean on you to look at your word. And Father, and if, and if they don't, that, that we are men of God and women of God who, who, who take your word and to share it. And Father, to do our role in our, and, to, and to understand our responsibility. And Father, to let this light shine in this dark world. And Father, I'm truly thankful for Christian Chapel, for the family here. And Father, for them just, just looking at and facing the danger that is before them. And Father, and just continually having a strong faith. And Father, to, 
and, and their love that they have for each other. And Father, how they've just been able to lean on each other during difficult times. And Father, right now, it may be hard for some of us to see the good, and Father, but we are thankful. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, for his death, burial, and resurrection. We're thankful for all the spiritual blessings that come from that. And Father, we just uh, uh, will never forget each day that you have given to us is a day that we can be thankful for, for the time that we do have with our families, for the time that we do have uh, just to uh, be your servant. And Father, be with us as we continue this worship this morning. Keep us safe. Let us always remember to do your will. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Wonderful race of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall this praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus. that when they go and buy a car, they make this comment, you know, I just want a car that can get me to point A to point B. You know, making it sound like that, hey, that point A to point B, there's not really that much that's in between that. And so just give me a car. It doesn't have to be, you know, really that good. I, I'm satisfied with whatever. It could be an old beat up truck. It could be just a little Prius car. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it can get me to point A to point B. And when they make that comment, it, it kind of makes it seem like that that point A to point B is a straight line. That there's really not that much to the in-between of the A and the B. And so they just kind of, you know, whatever I can get, as long as it'll get me to point A to point B. Same thing that we say to our kids, you know, when they're out looking for a car. You know, we just say, hey, as long as it can get you to point A to point B, then, then that's all it is. You don't need a Lexus. You don't need a BMW. You don't need a, you know, a Lamborghini or whatever it may be. You don't need one of those. You just need a good car that can just get you from this point to that point. And, you know, when you think about it, sometimes people, when they think about their spiritual life or when they think about just life in general, they think about, all right, from point A to point B is nothing more than just a straight line. Well, at least that's what it should be. That's at least what they expect life to be. It's just from point A to point B. Uh, it's just a straight line. And I'm here to tell you that our spiritual journey our road from point A to point B, when, when you take your last breath, is not a straight line. If there's ever more of a time that we know that that life is not a straight line, is a time that we have right now. That the time of A to B really looks 
like this. The start of your life in A, and then the road, the path that you have, and then moments of your life, you've got a straight line, things are going well, and you've got another straight line, and then you've got a big bend in it, and then you've got, you know, sickness and, 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 and death, and you've got depression, you've got loss of your job, and then you, you know, life is good. You have kids, you have the joy of watching them play ball, and, and everything that takes place from point A to point B when you take your last breath, it really looks like this. And then after life, you can either spend a life of just complete craziness that we find in hell, or just a straight line of, of peace and comfort in being in the presence of God. This is the only straight line that, uh, that, that, that we will ever really see, and it will last forever. But man, from point A to point B, until we take our last breath, does not look like that. It definitely looks like this. Think about Joseph. Think about his life. His life was not straight from point A to point B. I mean, you can see it from the hatred of, of his uh, brothers. You can think, see it through the jealousy. You can see it through them selling him and throwing him into a pit and then sell him into slavery that will eventually be Egyptian slavery. You can see how crazy Joseph's life is by how Potiphar's wife is seducing him and, and, then, and then accusing him of something that he didn't do. I mean, his life is just chaos, the curves and the twist that goes on in Joseph's life. You think about then him being thrown into prison. You think about uh, uh, him while he's in prison making friends there and then friends forgetting about him whenever they get out. And he's just for years just being left behind and just just not thought of. And when you think about this, you have to ask yourself, I wonder if Joseph ever looked at his path and said, you know what, what can I be thankful for? Was there ever a moment in his life he was just sitting there going, why, why am I having to go through this? God, where are you? And you know, whenever you look at this and times that we're going through right now, you know, you're, you're thinking about, I mean, this is the hardest that this has hit Monroe County. When you think about all the sickness that has gone on, we haven't had to go through this. And so right now you take a step back and say, how can I be thankful in times like this? Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, um, you can be thankful. Joseph is thankful because God is found in the darkness. God is not darkness, but he is found in that darkness. Because I'm going to tell you something. Tell you something. If it wasn't for Joseph going through this, then, then Joseph's family would not be saved at the end that we find from Genesis 37 and following. See, God knew that in order for Joseph's family to to be saved, where they're not having to deal with that famine, to deal with uh, uh, starvation, to not have to deal with that, then Joseph is going to have to go through some things in his road, in his path, in order for him to be put into a position to where he's able to uh, save his family. See, God was right there. God was on the road with Joseph. He is there walking with him, whether it is in the pit or whether it is in a situation with Potiphar's wife. God is with him when he was in prison, and he continues to be with him whenever he was even in rule. Why? Because Joseph's family will be saved. And it came through a path that looked just like this. I know it's very difficult right now to be thankful for things. But I can tell you that you can be thankful just in the fact that God is walking with you in this darkness. So how can we find thanksgiving in this path? With God walking with us, what, what, what can we do with that? And, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I think this is an extremely important passage because this is Paul dealing with a church that not only is dealing with some dictator persecution that is going on with the church, 
There's also a difficulty that's going on inside the church at Corinth. And there's, if there was ever time for Paul to bring about something that is good and, 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 and filled with blessings and, and with uh, thankfulness, it is in this chapter right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it deals with the scope of Christ's resurrection and your own personal resurrection through baptism. And it talks about the very last verse where you can find thanksgiving. It is the same thing in which uh, Joseph was able to do when he walked through his life. And it's the exact same thing we can do when we walk through our life that looks like this. Look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He is encouraging the church there not to be easily tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind of any teaching. You find that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. Paul is also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 that, hey, you can make uh, or your minds may be led astray. He is talking to people who, who is a, he's encouraging to be steadfast. But they're so easily with their mind led, or, led astray by anything of any form of teaching or doctrine or by any form of difficult things that go on in their life. They're, they're easily just move. And so I, I, I wanted to think about what does this word really mean then, steadfast? How can I be thankful for something like this? When you look at the Hebrew word for steadfast, it means this, to lean on or to take hold of. That's what steadfast is. Imagine Joseph walking through his journey and not leaning on or not holding on to something that is secure and firm. See, then Joseph, when he found himself in the pit or he found himself in prison or he found himself in a room with Potiphar's wife, he could have easily just been thrown away and been moved. But, but he didn't. Why? Because he leans on someone, and that is God, because he he grabs on to somebody, and that is God. And so in Isaiah chapter 26, in Isaiah 26 and verse 3, listen to what this says. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You know where peace is found? <laughs> peace is found is when you stay on God, when you hold on to him, when you lean on him. See, he is that perfect peace. He is the one that is there. He is the one that does not leave. He is the one that uh, uh, you want to build your foundation on. He is the one that completely loves you. He is the one that let or allowed his son to empty himself. He is the one that we can lean on. God will take us through the storm. God is the one in which you want to lean on during those times. Steadfast is the attitude you have when you say, no matter what my feelings tell me or how dark the circumstances are, I will put myself in the Lord's hand and trust in him. I will hold on to the resurrection of his son. See, Paul is, is, is sharing with them in this whole chapter the power of this resurrection and the power of your resurrection, and that is what you can hold on to because before that resurrection, faith can be very easily just swayed. But because that he was able to conquer death, you can now be steadfast. You can now hold on to this. You can lean on that resurrection. And that is why the apostles, whenever you see them after the resurrection, they're able to face death so much easier because they lean on him. Later on, you see this in 1 Corinthians 15. He, he goes on to says, listen, not only 
Do I want you to, uh, to be steadfast? He says, therefore, I want you to be immovable. In Job chapter 2 and verse 9, the, the wife said, you still hold fast after everything that has happened to you physically, after all the things that are taken away from you, you still holding on to God? Yes. What else do you want me to hold on to? I mean, this camera right here that's recording this is, is on this little tripod here. You don't want to hold on to something like that that can easily be uh, uh, moved? No, I want to hold on to this. I want to hold on to the thing that nobody can move. And so when you see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, it says this. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You know why uh, Demas was able uh, uh, to be moved? Because he was never really holding on to faith or hold on uh, to God. He was holding on to this present world. He loved the things that were part of this world. He liked everything that, that, that the devil was able to bring to him. And so he held on to that. And so when things got difficult, he moved into that direction. Why am I thankful? I'm thankful because I'm walking through this path and holding on to the Son of God. Why am I thankful? Because when I hold on to that and I lean on that, then this life and all of its storms, whether it's through COVID or whether it is through death or whether it is through all the temptations that go on in this life, I will not be moved. Why am I thankful? because I serve and I worship a God who cannot be moved and I lean on him. I'm steadfast on him. And Isaiah 26 tells us, and that brings us peace. That brings us peace because we cannot be moved. And the last thing this text says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I am thankful because God has given me today to love my family. God has given me today. This week, I was able to see my sister and her family for a whole week and get to spend another week with them. I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful that God has given me today to serve others, that God has given me today to take his word, and if that door is open, to share this word to others. That is something to be thankful for. Why? Because you're offering something that is immovable. You're offering something to give them that when these people that are dealing with death or dealing with difficult circumstances or dealing with, with physical ailment like COVID, you can offer something that can give them stability to where their faith will not move, where they're not easily tossed around. Always abounding in the work of God. Why? Because we have something that we can offer them That is solid. And so when I take a look at my path, I'm thankful that while I'm going in this journey, that God is walking in this darkness and in this path with me. And that I'm leaning and I'm holding on to him. And that while I'm holding on to him, that when I come in contact with people that need his word, that I have been given an opportunity to share that. That's good. We can be thankful for that. The last thing I want to say is something I think we just, uh, um, in dealing with 1 Corinthians 15, that we need to be thankful for. That God has given us a day to be resurrected to a new life. Miss Marlene was given an opportunity. She gave a call uh, the other day and says, listen, I want to be baptized into Christ. I want to be resurrected to a new life that we see in Romans chapter 6. I want to be clothed with Christ that we find in Galatians chapter 3 where everybody can be one. So we took Miss Marlene 
and we baptized her in Christ. In this dark path, in this dark world, when everything seems to just be in complete chaos right now in Monroe County, there is light and there is good. When you see someone who is willing to surrender themselves and to be resurrected to a new life. And we're thankful for Miss Marlene and thankful that uh, she did that because that is the good that we see in this world. And that is what we can be thankful for. Do you need to be resurrected to a new life through baptism? Do you need to, to hold on and to be secure and to hold fast to God who is something that you cannot move? If you need that, then take an opportunity to do that. Give us a call. Talk to any one of our elders. Talk to me. Talk to Bobby or Caleb. And let us come and let us help you. Thank you. I hope that you find today is a good day. It is the Lord's day. And so be thankful for that. We're praying for all of those who are dealing with circumstances and dealing with this uh, physical uh, ailment that, yeah, that you may have. We're praying for you. And so just know that this might be something that we have to do for the next week or two, or this just may be this time. But no matter what it is, just be thankful that God has given you today and lean on him. Like Joe and Dick, and, uh, hoping everyone had a happy Thanksgiving, uh, had plenty to eat this week, uh, had a good meal yesterday, of course had turnip greens with it. And we want to now take pause and take time to remember the Lord's Supper. You know, God, in his infinite uh, wisdom, knew that man would forget. We, we have good memories. And just like the uh, wording on you, most Lord's tables that says, do this in remembrance of me, uh, we all have memories, but sometimes they fail. Uh, spoke about turnip greens. You know, I picked a mess of turnip greens Wednesday, cooked them uh, yesterday for, for our Thanksgiving meal. And I told this to our 9 a.m. service before, there's not a time that I don't pick turnip greens or wash turnip greens that I don't think of my dad. And if he was living today, he'd be 108 years old this past October. But he died 40 years ago. But there's not a single time that I don't pick and wash turnip greens that I don't think of my daddy. Uh, either squirrel hunting or working in the garden or riding those two baker truck going trot lining. I think of him, but there's not a time in these last 40 years that I haven't thought of my dad when I was washing those greens. The reason being, the last memory I have of my father was the funeral. Uh, at Liberty, Liberty Church, Liberty Baptist Church there uh, between Amory and, and Nelson out in the country. Uh, Brother Bobby, Detroit Bobby, and Tommy Whaley uh, preached the funeral. Brother Bobby was the one that actually preached it in uh, you have to know Brother Bob, but he was the only preacher I ever knew growing up. We moved to Smithville in the early 50s and until uh, I graduated from college in 1975, he was the only preacher that uh, Smithville had there that, that, that I knew. So I grew up kind of under Brother Bob. He was the old timey preacher. You never saw him without a tie, be it July, out uh, walking into Smithville there. He had that tie on. But, uh, he preached Daddy's funeral. And he talked about turnip greens. Daddy would always, when they was in season, he would uh, pick the Bobbitts a, a mess of green several times and carry them to him. And, and Brother Bobbitt said, uh, you know, Brother Railder would wash those greens. He'd get all the grit and the grime, the insects, the fire and matter, just eat all that off of him. When, it, when he presented them greens uh, to us, they were ready to be cooked. They were pure didn't have anything in them. They were plain as they could be. And then he turned around and, and would, he uh, re related that to Christ's blood. Uh, and I know Brother Railder would want to say that you know, Christ's blood does the very same thing. It washes all the impurities out. It gets all the grit and the grind. And Brother Railder would pull the stems off if they were tough. And it's just like the blood of Christ. If we have tough skins, sin, it gets them also. Uh, and he, they were presented pure, just, just like the blood of Christ does. I want to read Hebrews uh, 9, 14. It says, uh, So surely the blood sacrifice of Christ can do much more. Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit 
as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will make us completely clean from the evil we have done. It, it will give us a clear conscience so that we can worship the living God. That's the easy to read version of Hebrews 9, 14. And that's what the blood of Christ does. It, it cleans us uh, to where we can worship, where we can present ourselves to God. Uh, back to our, to our remembrance. Like I say, we all have remembrance. And, and God told us or knew that being human, we would forget things. The Bible is full of memorials. I guess the first one starts off with uh, the rainbow after the flood. Cry, uh, God put that rainbow in the sky so we would remember the flood and, we, and his promise that they would, he wouldn't destroy the world. He told Noah that he wouldn't destroy uh, the world will flood again. So that, that, that's kind of a memorial. And, and then you get to the Passover where the, uh, God sent the death angel, the angel of death through, through Egypt and killed all the firstborn. Uh, God made the Passover to, so that Egyptians, the Israelites, would remember that they would be, you know, uh, that God spared them during this time. And of course, uh, we remember even uh, the Ten Commandments has a memorial in it. God says uh, in Deuteronomy to uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He, he tells them that, uh, that, you know, we, he, he worked six days. He created the world in six days, and then on the seventh day he rested. And that's what he wanted the uh, Israelites to do, to remember that. Remember that he is the God, he's the creator, and he did this in six days, but on the seventh day, he rested. I guess the final one that I, I read about would be the 12 stones of Joshua when the Israelites came across the, the Jordan River. Uh, he, he told them to pick up a stone, each member of the tribe to pick up a stone. He carried, they carried it to Gilgad and, and, and placed those stones there so they could tell their generation, generation after generation, about how God stopped the flow of the Jordan River where they could cross with the ark on dry land. So, you know, the Bible's full of memorials so we can remember. And that's what this Lord's Supper is today. You know, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, God, uh, Jesus instituted uh, telling us to, to remember his death. And that's what this bread and this, and this juice does that we're fixing to partake. It remembers, we're to remember his death. And at this time, I want us to remember, you know, the, the, the blood of Christ, the body of Christ that hung on that cross of Calvary. You know, we, uh, our, our minds are frail. We all have different memories. And when, when God, Christ instituted this 2,000 years ago, uh, he knew we would forget things. You know, maybe my ancestors 100 years from now may be walking on that old clay dirt there at Liberty Cemetery and see Daddy's tombstone and... He'll see the, they'll see the name, but they won't know anything about it. They won't know the turnip grain story. They won't know the squirrel hunting story. It won't be a memory. Uh, but we'll remember Christ's death. It's been 2,000 years, 2,000 more years. If we partake of this each week, we will always remember Christ's death on that cross at Calvary. But this time, we're going to partake of the loaf. Uh, if you'll pray with me now. And then, Father, we do pause at this time uh, to remember your son's death on that cruel cross of Calvary. As we partake of this loaf, which to have Christians around the world on this first day of the week represents your son's body that hung on that cross, that suffered all the pain, that endured all the things for us. We pray to him, Father, that we'll remove all the worldly thoughts, all the other memories that we have at this time, but just remember Christ's death and his body as he hung on that cross as we partake of this love. May we do this in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Pray with me as we continue uh, thanking God for the fruit of the vine. We continue our prayer, dear Father, this memorial of your son's death as you told us to do the first of each, each week. As we take this juice, this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's shed blood on the cruel cross of Calvary, it does wash away all our sins. It gets all the sins, the big and the small sins away. Help us remember the suffering that he did.
to make this possible. The wounds in his head, his hands, his side, his feet, all the blood that came forth just for the remission of our sins, doing it in our stead. May we do this in a manner pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Glory land is not so far off.